My name is Donna Wills and I'm the Regional Manager for the Arthritis Society in Manitoba, Nunavut. We are part of Prairie Division, which encompasses Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, our Executive Director is in Calgary and I help to oversee the Manitoba operations here as, um, as the Regional Manager. Now, on behalf of the Arthritis Society, we are just so thrilled to welcome you to our Inflammatory Arthritis Forum here in Brandon. And I know that we have people not only from Brandon, from, but from all around the area as well. So thank you very much for making the drive-in today. I believe that you will find the information shared with you to be very, very valuable. We have a, a special welcome to our Brandon Arthritis Support Group. If you're with the support group, wave your hand. Let's just see. There we go. Yeah, uh, this group meets on a monthly basis to, to learn, to support each other, and also to be there for the community, for those that are newly diagnosed, to be able to answer questions about resources that are available, etc. So if you weren't aware that there was a support group, now you do know, and uh, those ladies are the ones you can ask them a little bit more about it. There are 4.6 million Canadians with arthritis and over 200,000 of them are in Manitoba. I'm new with the Arthritis Society and I just started in December and some of the, those statistics were something that really shocked me. I had no idea that basically, you know, just under one, uh, one third of the province's population has arthritis of some kind. So that was shocking to me. What was even more shocking is of those 200,000, that almost 60% of them are still in the workforce. So what people quite often think of as, you know, you're gonna get it when you're older, you know, it's something that's gonna, that's part of older, uh, your elder part of life. It, it really isn't. Uh, many people are still in the workforce, they're trying to balance their, um, their children and their work as well as, as their disease. So that was quite a surprise for me when I learned that statistic. And the fact that since the 1980s, there were over 1,500 kids in Manitoba alone that were diagnosed. Some of them were only a few months old when they were diagnosed. And again, that was something that really, really surprised me when I learned that. If anybody is uh, tech savvy at all out there, we do have a Facebook page at Arthritis Manitoba. And we have a Twitter handle at Arthritis MB, just in case you're into that. Okay, we're ready to move on to the beginning of our program. And we are starting with Dr. David Robinson. He will have time for your questions after his presentation. So if there are some pads of paper on the table. If you need to make a note of what your question is, uh, please go ahead and uh, save them until the end. Dr. Robinson is a rheumatologist and an associate professor of medicine at the University of Manitoba. He's the director of the Arthritis Center and head of the section of rheumatology at Health Sciences Center. He's the undergraduate and postgraduate program director for rheumatology and also a traveling consultant for the J.A. Hildes Northern Medical Unit. I don't know when he has time to sleep. Dr. Robinson focuses his practice on more severe arthritis, severe forms of rheumatoid, rheumatic, there we go, disease, including rheumatoid arthritis and connective tissue diseases. He also runs specialty clinics in vasculitis and scleroderma. So help me welcome Dr. Robinson to give his presentation for the day. Thanks for coming out. I, I'm shocked to see so many people here on a beautiful fall day. It's sort of the, like the last one. Tomorrow there's gonna be 12 feet of snow, so we'll see how things go. I'm, uh, I'm going to just fill you in on what we're going to talk about, and if it's, and then everybody will get up and leave when they don't see what they want to talk about, but we'll see how it goes. We're going to do an overview of inflammatory arthritis. What is that in, in particular? And we're going to talk about various types, and in particular, we're going to talk about rheumatoid arthritis, which is the, the most common form of inflammatory arthritis, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about psoriatic arthritis as well. We're going to talk about principles for managing arthritis, in particular inflammatory disease, and they apply to all the different forms. Don't tell anybody, but we treat a lot of this stuff the same, okay? It's a secret. We're going to talk about some of the medications, and then hopefully we'll have lots of time for some questions um, that uh, you can ask. And if I haven't covered your favorite topic, by all means, please, uh, please ask. 
So Donna told you that uh, uh, more than four million Canadians have arthritis. It really means, the itis part means inflammation and arthro means joint. So it's really inflammation of a joint. And there's 120 different kinds. We have about 45 minutes. Let me do the math here. I got about 20 seconds per type. So let's get started. Hope you're paying attention. I'm not gonna do that. That would be mean. What I'm gonna talk about is a couple of forms. And first I wanna talk about what inflammatory arthritis isn't, okay? And what it isn't is osteoarthritis. And osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis. It makes up about two thirds or three quarters of the people who have arthritis. And it's what we think about is wear and tear. You know, just in Winnipeg, they had the Heritage Classic. They had all the old alumni jet skies skating around and aching and creaking and moaning and groaning. And of course, they all have a little bit of wear and tear arthritis. Um, but there's actually many different causes. And if you get frostbite and damage your fingers, then eventually that can turn into osteoarthritis. And it's really the final endpoint for all the different kinds of arthritis that we have. So it's not just injuries, because of course, how do you injure your left fifth knuckle, right? And why does that one get bony and enlarged? And so that's, it's very common. Oops, I lost a slide here. What else isn't it? It's, oh, what does OA look like? Okay. See, I can barely read my own slides. So basically, you get start with pain in the joint. Now, it might be right in the joint itself, or it might be referred from somewhere else. We see lots of people who come in and they complain, oh, you know, my knee hurts, and we examine their knee, and in fact, it's really their hip that's the problem when we examine it. It's usually worse with activity, so if you're sitting there, it feels a little bit better. You get up and start shoveling things and then it hurts. When you get up in the morning, you might be a little bit stiff, but you know, five, 10, 15 minutes later, it feels better, okay? And if you sit here for an hour and listen to me yammer on and you get up, you're gonna be stiff again. We call that gelling phenomenon. So every time you do that, when you get up after sitting for a long time and you feel a little stiff, you just go, hey, I know what that is, that's gelling. And then loss of function. So if you've got arthritis in your lower extremities, you might have trouble walking. If you've got it in your hands, you might lose your grip strength and have to get somebody else to do all those jar openings. So any joint can be involved with osteoarthritis if it's been injured or had something else happen to it. But in fact, there's some that are very, very common. So the last knuckles on your fingers are very common. The middle knuckles, the base of your thumb right down here, this one here. Lots of people complain about their wrist, but really it's way down here that it hurts. And if you're doing anything with your thumb, it causes problems. Hips and knees. And then this great big toe here where everybody gets a big bunion and it really hurts. Lots of women get it because they wear fashionable footwear and then they can't wear fashionable footwear anymore. <laughs> and then of course, osteoarthritis in the lower back. So here's some pictures of some folks. Um, you can see this knee looks fairly straight and this one takes a little bit of a bend where it's not supposed to. Okay, and that's because of some of the loss of cartilage in it. You can see that here are these uh, knuckles here and these fingers. And if you put your fingers on those l bony lumps, they're really hard and they're bony and they're, they're um, solid. And sometimes they get a little red and they, get, they look a little inflamed. M most of the time they uh, just sort of grumble along. And then here's a fellow uh, who has a bit of, it looks almost like his knee's a little enlarged. And that's partly because he's lost some of the muscle around his calf and around his thigh here. Now the other thing that inflammatory arthritis isn't, and this is very important, is it's not what we call mechanical back pain. So, you know, back pain is really, really common. Almost everybody gets back pain at some point in their life, and some people have it chronically, it lasts for more than a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And we talk about it being due to, you know, osteoarthritis to the spine, but I'm gonna tell you a doctor's secret, okay? If we took everybody at the age of 60 and x-rayed their spine, at the age of 60, every single person will have changes of osteoarthritis on their x-ray. And it won't relate to whether they have pain in their back or not. Okay, so 
When you go into your doctor's office and they say, oh, you know, I got a really sore back, and he x-rays your back and goes, well, Mrs. Jones, I know why your back is sore. You've got osteoarthritis here. But in fact, it's not always the osteoarthritis. It might be the muscles that are sore. It might be something else that's causing the problem. And very often, this kind of pain is due to the muscles themselves that are just unhappy and a little bit strained. So this is what we call mechanical back pain, and I'll tell you how that differs from the other form a little bit later. So what is inflammatory arthritis? Well, it's, it's a forms of arthritis where there's significant inflammation. I told you that the osteoarthritis, those end knuckles, they sometimes get a little warm, they sometimes get a little red. Well, in this case, there's lots of inflammation going on. And the joints can sometimes get very red and hot. They can actually, and what we can see is activation of your immune system. So we can measure it in your blood that your whole immune system is active and causing problems. And here's some knuckles that are big and swollen. Now, if you put your fingers on these ones, they're squishy like a grape because of all the fluid that's in them. Okay, now I'm going to give you a case. You get to be the diagnosticians here. And it's kind of a funny writing, and it's not because they don't spell well, it's just because it's an old case. So he goes to bed and sleeps well, but at about 2 o'clock in the morning is waked by the pain, seizing either his great toe, the heel, or the ankle. Hmm. The pain is like that of dislocated bones, sometimes like the gnawing of a dog. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Can you make a diagnosis? Such a quick and exquisite pain that it's not able to bear the weight of the clothes. So this is a description from Dr. Thomas Sydenham, who suffered from this himself, and it was an attack of gout. Okay, So gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis, and you can see how red and hot these toes get, and it's very difficult to walk on them. When I stop being working at the university, I'm going to open a gout clinic, and I'm going to make all my money off of valet parking, okay? <laughs> Very smart. So gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis, and it's caused by uric acid, which is a normal product in our body, but some, some people don't get rid of it very well. And so it, it builds up, and then it actually builds up around the joints. And for reasons, some reasons we know and some reasons we don't, you get the sudden hot swelling of the joints, and it usually gets better after five to seven days. The problem with gout is that after time, it becomes more chronic, it becomes more persistent, and it can cause damage in the joints. And so I don't have a lot of time to talk about gout today, but it can progress to a chronic destructive arthritis, but most of the time it comes and it goes. Rheumatoid arthritis is uh, very common. It affects about one in every hundred people. And it is a systemic inflammatory autoimmune disease. So what I mean by that is, is that it actually affects your whole body. It is, there's lots of signs of inflammation. And it's autoimmune. So your immune system, which is supposed to spend its time fighting off the flu and bacteria and things like that, becomes confused and it actually starts to attack your own joints and other organs. More, most commonly your joints, like your fingers and, and knuckles, but also your lungs, your skin and your eyes in some cases. And it's associated with, because it's an autoimmune disease, making antibodies, your immune system makes antibodies to some proteins in your own system that we can measure. One of them is called rheumatoid factor and another one's called anti-CCP. Now, rheumatoid arthritis affects 1% of the population, and the peak onset isn't in 70 and 80 year olds. It's really in people who are still in their working years. 40, 30 to 50 year olds, really, is when it comes on. Twice as many women over men, and we don't know why that is. And we don't really know what the cause is. We know that in some cases it runs in families a little bit, but in a lot of cases there's no family history. And we don't have a lot of uh, clues as to whether there's a virus or something that triggers it. Um, but we do know that smoking can increase your risk. And there's no known cure. What does it feel like? Well, it's a little bit different than osteoarthritis. The joints are warm and swollen. And any joint can be affected. 
except for your back and those very last knuckles on your fingers. You feel stiff in the morning when you get out of bed, but it doesn't go away after 10 or 15 minutes. It lasts for hours, and some people say they never loosen up during the day. So our classic is osteoarthritis goes away in 10 minutes, rheumatoid arthritis takes an hour, which means that all of my patients show up with 40 minutes of early morning stiffness, right? So just right in the middle. Decreased energy level, and you can actually feel really sucked out with this, and some patients even lose weight like they have some sort of a cancer. Okay, I'm gonna take you to medical school here. So this is one of the slides that I show my uh, medical students. This is a cartoon of a joint, and you can see here's one, bone, not that kind of a joint, okay? But <laughs> one bone here, another bone here. This is the cartilage, that hard, rubbery stuff at the end of the bones, right, when you're chewing on the chicken bone. And this is the capsule that holds the two bones together. And lining it is this very thin, delicate tissue that we call synovium. And its job is to nourish the cartilage and to provide uh, oil for the joint that lubricates the joint. This is what it looks like under the microscope, this normal synovium here, very light, delicate kind of tissue, not a lot of cells in it. And it becomes, in rheumatoid arthritis, it becomes thickened and uh, becomes inflamed. And what you can see is the difference between this and this. You don't need to be a histologist. There's lots more cells and much more thickened. And as that grows, it actually eats into the cartilage in the bone. So over here, this sort of pink stuff here is cartilage, and this stuff over here is bone, and this is the synovium, and you can see it eating into these, and it causes destruction of the joints, almost like a cancer that doesn't spread elsewhere, but it eats away at the tissue. And that causes damage to the joints that's very typical. So you can see swelling on these knuckles here and over here, and you can see these fingers have actually moved out of place where they should be. This is a gentleman who I followed up north who had disease since he was a teenager. And um, even though our best trials, he really had difficulty responding to therapy. So this is, he's 50 years old in this picture. He's six foot three inches tall and he weighs 112 pounds, okay? And so you can see the amount of damage that he has in his hands and the wasting that he has from his muscles. Fortunately, People don't get like this anymore, okay? The other form of inflammatory arthritis is, is a family of them that we call spondyloarthropathies. If you say it enough, you'll strain your tongue, so take it easy. These are types of arthritis, and the main thing that sort of holds them all together is that you often get inflammation in the spine. Remember I talked to you about mechanical back pain? Well, we're, now we're gonna talk about inflammatory back pain, which is a little bit different. So these people get, like the rheumatoid arthritis patients, they get more than an hour of morning stiffness. And this inflammation that's in the spine often leads to fusion of it. I'll show you some pictures. But it can be, uh, affect other joints as well, and I'll, I'll fill you in as we go. So the typical spondyloarthropathy is a disease called ankylosing spondylitis. You see, it just gets harder and harder to, to pronounce after a while. And Again, it mainly affects the spine in this case. And here's what I'm talking about where I talk about fusion. So this gentleman has had long-standing ankylosing spondylitis. And you can see that he doesn't have the normal sway in his lower back that you or I do. It's actually fused solid and stiff. And the unfortunate part about ankylosing spondylitis is that as you fuse, you tend to fuse in a, in a bent over position like a question mark. So this gentleman has a, a hunched over position, but he's actually unable to straighten up. So that's as far up as he can look, and you can imagine how disabling this could be in day-to-day -day life. This is actually a, a surgical specimen of a hip joint taken from a patient. And what's really different about ankylosing spondylitis and some of the spondyloarthropathies is that you get damage to the joints but you also get bone formation so that the bones fuse. So here is the thigh bone, okay, cut apart. 
Here it is cut in half. Here's the thigh bone here. It goes like that. This is the part of the pelvis that the thigh bone goes with. It's a, it's a ball and socket. And where there's supposed to be space between the two, it's completely filled with bone. So this is a rigid, solid, bony hip that doesn't move at all, which is why it's on a specimen table instead of in a patient. OK, now how do you know if you have one of these spondyloarthropathies or if you just have back pain? Well, inflammatory back pain is a little bit different. You know, back pain's uh, ubiquitous, which means everybody has it. Chronic back pain is common, and we define that more than three months. And 15% of all chronic back pain is inflammatory. So we're talking about small numbers of people here. And it's important to be able to distinguish one from the other. So people who have mechanical back pain, like I showed you before, tend to be over the age of 40 when they show up. So I run a clinic at the Health Science Center, and every week I get another doctor who's 45 years old walking in going, oh, my back is killing me. I just did it in. Oh, oh, oh. It's usually sudden onset, so you can point when it happened. I was raking leaves, I was shoveling snow, I picked up my grandkid, I did something like this, and my back went out. It's made better by rest. And interestingly, although we give you things like uh, Advil and Naproxen and Aleve and all the rest, it's the first thing out of our hands, it almost never works. So the effect of those drugs on mechanical back pain is really limited. So inflammatory back pain often happens in teenagers and young people, so in their, in their teens and their 20s, so very early. It's hard to pinpoint when it starts. When they tell you when did it start, they I don't know. You know, it's not just because they're teenagers. It's worse when they sit around and with rest, and particularly at night, and it improves with activity. So the more active these people are, the better they feel. They have morning stiffness more than 30 minutes or an hour. And some patients respond extremely well to these anti-inflammatories. So that you can, it can sometimes be used to help diagnose it. Not all of them, but some of them. OK, so another form of spondyloarthropathy that is uh, fairly common is one that goes along with psoriasis. So it's called psoriatic arthritis. Psoriasis is a skin disease that is fairly common in the population. And about 10% of the patients who have psoriasis will have some joint involvement along with it. Unlike rheumatoid arthritis, it's about the same number of men as women. This is the prevalence. This is how many people there are, about uh, 4 in 1,000 to 1 in 100, depending on what groups of folks you look at. And most of the patients develop the psoriasis before the arthritis, so we get a lot of referrals from the dermatology community saying, this patient who has psoriasis has now got some joint pains, is this psoriatic arthritis. About 20% of them get it at the same time, and then some of them present us with arthritis, and we say, hmm, and then a couple of years later they might develop the skin disease. These are the common locations for psoriasis. You know, the scalp or on the face, uh, the trunk around the belly button, in the, in the buttocks, uh, the backs of the elbows and the knees are very common, and the nails can be affected as well. And this is a typical picture of psoriasis. It's a scaly, raised, um, often itchy kind of skin rash. Now, psoriatic arthritis is a little different than rheumatoid arthritis. It can be quite variable. Sometimes it looks just like rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes it looks just like ankylosing spondylitis. And sometimes it looks like something in between. And you can get erosions and loss of bone, like I showed you in rheumatoid arthritis, where you actually have damage. And you can see here's a finger joint. And you can see the nice, round, normal bone here. And you can see how it's been eaten away on this one, OK? So very, a lot of damage there. What's different is that I like ankylosing spondylitis, you can make new bone. And so you can actually fuse joints, usually later on. So sometimes we see a mix of these findings in the same person, and that gives us a clue as to what we're dealing with. So psoriatic arthritis can affect 
uh, the spine, but also lots of the peripheral joints. And, and so here's uh, some person, you can tell that they have psoriatic arthritis because they have a skin rash on their hands. That's always very helpful when we're making a diagnosis. Um, and they can affect the, these last knuckles here, and they can affect all these knuckles as well as these ones and the wrists and just about anything. Now, another funny sort of thing that happens in psoriatic arthritis is something called dactylitis, or what we like to call sausage toes. So instead of just the joint becoming inflamed, the whole digit becomes inflamed. So here's a little piggy that looks fairly normal, okay? And then if you look at this one here, it's a little bit swollen, and then this one is completely, looks like a breakfast sausage, okay? And again, you can tell there's a little bit of psoriasis on there. I'm not sure what a breakfast is, but that's okay. Um, but these are uh, typical of psoriasis here. And the nails are affected in psoriatic arthritis. So sometimes it can be something very minimal, like these, you can see these little tiny pits, we call these pitting. And sometimes it can be lifting. So this is, the fancy word for this is onycholysis, where the nail tends to lift off its bed a little bit. And then sometimes they can look very damaged um, in these kinds of cases. Again, you can see the red and scaly skin changes here next to it, and the, um, and the nails are fairly damaged. Sometimes it's difficult to tell those apart from fungal infections in the nail, and sometimes we have to send cultures to know whether, uh, what's actually causing it. Now, some psoriatic arthritis patients have the worst arthritis that we've, we can really see. They have very, very destructive joints. And so you can tell, if you look at this finger here, the bones have been eroded away so much that there's really just the tissues left behind. And this can actually be telescoped out and all the rest. I had one of my patients who was twiddling her thumb the other day like this. It was very unsettling. Um, the, uh, it didn't bother her, though. What's other also very odd about this disease is you can see how badly damaged this finger is, but look how normal these two fingers look. They're completely unaffected, which is a very unique feature of this disease. You can have inflammation in the eye, and this is usually painful and red, and it usually requires an urgent assessment by an eye specialist with lots of topical steroids and usually some Therapy, some systemic therapy as well, some pills. And you can have something called enthesitis, which always makes me feel like I'm lisping when I say enthesitis. But it's really where the tendons and ligaments insert into bone. You can see that they have these little fibers that, that anchor into the bone, and that's where you get some inflammation. So when we look at it clinically, it's where the tendons insert into the, uh, into the heel bone here, your Achilles tendon, or at the bottom of your foot, or even where all your trunk muscles attach into your, into your pelvis can become inflamed. And you know, we think about when tendons get sore as like a tendonitis or sometimes a tendinosis, and really that's where the, that's um, a problem that happens in the middle of the tendon whereas this is really at the attachment to the bone. Okay, so um, psoriatic arthritis can affect the spine, like ankylosing spondylitis, and you can see these big bony lumps here on the sides of the spine that have fused it together. And we can sometimes see, these take a long time to form, we can sometimes see early changes with an MRI. So if your doctor's thinking that you might have psoriatic arthritis or a spondyloarthropathy may send you for an MRI. This is an MRI of the sacroiliac joint. So now we're looking down on top of it, and you can actually see here's where the joint is. And the sacroiliac joint is where the spine, the middle part of your pelvis, meets the wings of your pelvis, okay? And there you can see these little white spots are where there's inflammation within the bone there, and there's eating away of the bone as well. Now, unlike rheumatoid arthritis, 
we don't have any special tests that we can do to tell us that you have psoriatic arthritis. We have to do it based on our, um, on our, uh, how you present and what your history is and what physical findings you have. So like most of my, most of the time people present with an arthritis in my clinic, I say, okay, this is what I think you have. I reserve the right to change my mind in the next year or so, okay, because sometimes I do. There are no autoantibodies or special tests, oops, no autoantibodies or special tests. There may be signs of inflammation in the blood, but that's not very specific. If you get a cold, you get signs of inflammation in your blood. And there is a genetic test that sometimes is associated with it, but this genetic test is present in 10% of the population, so it's not particularly helpful in making a diagnosis. Now that you know everything that I know about arthritis, let's move on to management, okay? I hope you're paying attention because there there's a test coming later. I might be making that up. All right, so we want to do four things no matter who we're treating and what we're doing with, rheumatoid, with arthritis, okay? No matter what kind they have. One is we want to make the patient feel better. We want to relieve their pain and the inflammation. I think that's probably on the patient's list too is my guess. We want to maintain and improve their joint range of motion. So range of motion is how much you can actually move your joint through any given range, okay, through any movement. And your joints are very much like my mother used to say about my face. You know, she said, if you keep making that face, it's going to stay that way. So when your joints are sore, if you leave them in the same place for a long period of time, you very quickly lose the ability to do that, okay? We want to prevent further joint destruction from all that inflammation, and we want to limit this until you're 300 years old. Most people are pretty happy to go into a wheelchair when they're 300. I haven't had anybody complain about that yet. Now, non-drug treatment is really important for all arthritis, but it's really the first line of treatment for osteoarthritis, okay? You can go into your doctor's office and be told, I have osteoarthritis, and you say, well, give me that magic pill. There is no magic pill for osteoarthritis. All of these things are very important. We don't have a lot of time to go through them, but, you know, energy conservation, where you plan and pace and prioritize what you do, uh, education, like we're doing today, exercise, weight reduction, physiotherapy and occupational therapy can sometimes be very helpful. So um, it's something that you really need to talk about. All the medications that we use for osteoarthritis are really pain relievers to help you do all of these things. These are also important for inflammatory arthritis, um, but medications become much more important. So we use Tylenol or acetaminophen. We use anti-inflammatories, and sometimes Dr. Robinson takes a big rusty needle and sticks it into somebody's joint. And um, those can be sometimes helpful. They make people feel better, but in the inflammatory arthritis, they don't really stop any of the joint damage from happening, okay? So people can continue on and end up with that. This is um, uh, one of my favorite slides. The Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1950. Does anybody know what they got, what these gentlemen got that for? They got it for using cortisone in rheumatoid arthritis patients. It was the very first time and the very first thing any sort of cortisone was used in any disease. And people got out of wheelchairs and they walked and they climbed stairs. It was a miracle drug. Okay, absolute miracle drug. However, after a couple of years, it became known that there was lots of side effects to cortisone and prednisone, and now my patients call it the miracle drug from hell. So, cortisone or corticosteroids, that's prednisone. Sometimes we use a drug called Depomedrol, and sometimes we inject those things into people's joints, are very good at reducing the inflammation of inflammatory arthritis. If you take a, it's like taking a wet blanket and putting it on a campfire, okay? It just puts it right out right away. But there are lots of side effects, and most of the drugs that you take on a day-to-day -day basis, a few percentage of people will get side effects from them, but with cortisone, everybody gets the side effects eventually. It's very reliable that way. So we want to limit the use of these to either very low doses over long periods of time, or as a bridge to safer acting drugs. 
So for inflammatory arthritis, those safer acting drugs are what we call disease modifying. The AR stands for anti-rheumatic drugs, or DMARDs is how we pronounce this. And these are the, the typical names that you might see. There's methotrexate is the most commonly used one. You may have heard of people getting gold injections in the past. Well, I don't think I have anyone in my practice on gold injections anymore. Um, very, uh, lots of side effects to gold injections. But we use other medications like hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine. There's a brand new one that you might have seen called tofacitinib or zeljans, which is advertised as well. And these relieve pain and inflammation. They slow down the rate of joint damage, and they're safer than prednisone for long-term use. Sounds good to me. There's some problems. They're very slow to work. They take weeks to months to sort of kick in. There's sometimes some nasty side effects. They're safer than prednisone, but there are some people who get side effects with them. So they can make you sick to your stomach, they can make your liver inflamed. They can make your blood counts go low. And you won't have any symptoms to tell you that your liver's unhappy, so you've got to go for blood tests on a regular basis to, when you have these drugs. And this is probably the worst part, is, is that they're very individual who they work for. So we often have to do a trial and error process to find the drug or the combination of drugs that works for a given patient. And each of those trials takes three to four months to sort out. So it becomes a very long process in some cases to make people feel better. Some people get better with the first trial, which is good, but some people need combinations and all the rest. For patients who um, don't respond to the traditional drugs that we use, in the last now 15 years, we have had a real revolution in treatment, and there's a group of drugs called biologics. Biologic is Greek for expensive, okay? And these are large protein molecules that are targeted to specifically block key molecules in inflammation. So we've taken the knowledge that we've gained about how inflammation works and what molecules drive particular pathways, and now we can target a very specific way to, to block that. They're given intravenously or as an injection under the skin because they're big proteins. You just digest them in your stomach if you took them by mouth, so they have to be given by a needle. And they're very expensive. They're anywhere from twenty to $40,000 per year for the ones that we use for arthritis. There are some biologics that are used for other diseases that are as much as $400,000 a year, and they're not uh, used very much. But these are very expensive. And because they're not a cure, people have to keep taking them over and over and over again. Right? So they're limited to patients who have failed the usual chemistry. And when you look, they, they grow them up in yeast and bacteria and things like that, so it looks like you're in a brewery when you go to these places. There's big you know, canisters, like they're brewing the stuff, and the, and the organism makes the protein, and then we isolate it and we give it to patients. The most common ones that we use for both rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis are called TNF inhibitors, or and TNF stands for tumor necrosis factor. And, and you've probably seen ads for these on TV, uh, certainly from the states. There's infliximab or Remicade. There's now a, a, a generic-like uh, Remicade form. Etanercept or Enbrel, Humira, Symphony, and Simsia. And some of these are given intravenously, and some of them are given under the skin or subcutaneously. And TNF is a very critical inflammation molecule in both rheumatoid arthritis and the spondyloarthropathies like psoriatic arthritis. And when we block it, it results in decreased inflammation and decreased damage. And some people have a, a very good effect, and, but a few people have what I like to call a hallelujah effect where we give them this drug and they're dancing pirouettes and doing much better. But again, they take one to sort of three months to sort of work and to try out to see how they're going to work. So here's a couple of examples. So here's Phil Mickelson, who has psoriatic arthritis, and his golf career was pretty much uh, on the ropes uh, when he developed the psoriatic arthritis. He started on one of these biologics, and he has done remarkably well and goes on to win more tournaments. 
And this is Leanne Rhymes, who I didn't know from a hole in the ground before I put this talk together, but apparently she has really bad psoriasis. Can you see it? I can't see it. Um, but it apparently is uh, well um, cared for by one of these uh, drugs. So um, there are some problems with TNF inhibitors. You know, one of my mentors once told me that you always, when a new drug comes out on the market, always use it in the first two years because after that it develops side effects. Okay? <laughs> so there's infections. About 10% of people get nuisance infections, sometimes sinus, sometimes bladder infections. Um, about 5% will develop more serious infections like infections in their joints or those sorts of things that require hospitalization. And if you're on one of these and your doctor gives you antibiotics for sinuses or for bronchitis or for pneumonia, it's really important not to take your biologic until you've finished your antibiotics because it's not because they don't like each other, it's just that the infection can get away from you if you're, if you're sick enough to need antibiotics. You can't take any live vaccines, uh, like the shingles vaccine or yellow fever when you're on these drugs, and so we often um, uh, have that question asked of us, particularly about the shingles vaccine. Um, one, one infection, in fact, I skipped this line, that is um, a, a, an issue with the TNF inhibitors is that if you had exposure to TB when you were a kid, it can hang out in your body for the rest of your life and until you die of a heart attack at 90 or something and never cause you problems. But if we give you one of these drugs, it can actually wake it up. So that's called sleeping TB, and it can reactivate it. And so before you start them, you should always have screening for it. We do it with a skin test and with a chest X-ray. And these TNF inhibitors always work best if we combine them with one of the other more traditional uh, disease-modifying drugs. There are other biologics that we use, particularly for rheumatoid arthritis. One of them is rituximab, another one is called Arencia or Abatacept, um, and then another one is called Actemra. And these are alternatives to all of those TNF inhibitors. We often use them more as a second line or for people who have specific reasons to be on them. Psoriatic arthritis, I want to say a word about it just because it's a little bit different. Is, um, is sort of differentiate. We used to treat it very much like rheumatoid arthritis, and it's a little bit different. Um, we do use all of the other things like physio and occupational therapy and anti-inflammatories and corticosteroids. Because we're treating really both the skin and the joints, we often work in combination with the dermatologists, and so patients are often on lots of topical agents, either topical steroids or other medications, along with ultraviolet light, possibly for the, to try and control the skin. If we get really lucky and we start somebody on methotrexate or one of the TNF inhibitors, it works for both their skin and their arthritis really well, and they don't have to do very much of that. We do use the disease-modifying drugs for the skin and the arthritis, and the typical disease-modifying drugs work really well for things like elbows and fingers and ankles, but they don't work for the spine inflammation. So if you have spine inflammation, we often have to use the biologics in order to control that. So it's a, it is actually important that we make a different, uh, uh, the right diagnosis in patients in order to make them better. Because um, the, that spine tends to fuse up over time in patients who have spine involvement, the exercises that we get people to do are very important so that if you do fuse up, you fuse up in a straight position rather than looking like a question mark because it's much more functional. There was a, um, one of my mentors in medical school who uh, retired shortly after I started to practice, had very bad ankylosing spondylitis, and he was stiff as a board, but he was straight up. And we always had to raise the bed to about five and a half feet so that he could listen to the heart when we were uh, around. The, um, again, so you can see all of these are really focusing on trying to get the person to lean back and to rotate and keep that spine nice and straight. There are some new therapies for psoriatic arthritis that are out there that are specifically for psoriatic arthritis, which again, makes us having to not treat everything the same a little more important. 
One of them is called a premolast, and the easy word for this is otesla. It's a pill that you take twice daily. And um, it does have some side effects like nausea and diarrhea, but it's easier on things like your liver and your blood counts than methotrexate and some of the other pill forms of treatment that we use. Um, and it has a lower cost than the biologics. Um, it's not covered yet in Manitoba. The government's looking at it. They're thinking about it. They're very slow to decide these things. But we can sometimes get a hold of it if we need it. There's another drug called Stelera or Ustekinumab, and it, it's approved for psoriasis, so it has to be uh, ordered by a dermatologist or I have to go begging on my knees to the government to let them approve it. Um, and um, it works very well for psoriasis and probably a little less well for the arthritis, but there are some people who respond very well from the arthritis point of view to this. And then very, very recently approved was another drug called secukinumab. One of my uh, colleagues calls these biologics all the unpronounceables. I think that's sort of a good descriptor. And it's an injection that's given monthly. It's newly approved, and, and we haven't actually used it in anybody yet, but uh, we'll be trying it at some point in time. And now, I think that's the end. So I want to give you some time to ask some questions about what you need to know. That's great. So the question is really about something called Intiflex. I have a whole hour-long talk that's entitled Secrets Your Doctor is Keeping From You. Okay. <laughs> um, and I keep, a, I keep a file at work of the various things that people bring in that they have either seen or tried or that sort of thing. And it varies quite a bit. So, so those kinds of products fall under the, under the category of what we call unproven therapies. Sometimes there's the, a hint of truth in, the base, in how they're based. So they might say that there's something to do with stem cells. And sure enough, people are looking at stem cells as therapy for all sorts of diseases. But the way that they're actually using it doesn't make any sense. Sometimes it's as simple as the same kind of treatment that's in A535, like a menthol or uh, capsaicin, which is a pepper, um, uh, a topical pepper, a hot pepper spray kind of thing that you can put on that helps with pain. But most of the time, these things are not very effective. They're certainly not going to be very effective for inflammatory arthritis, and they won't prevent any joint damage. They are usually harmless, okay? And they usually don't interfere. It's a good idea to tell your doctor if you're taking them in case there is an interaction with something that you're on. And um, the... You found it. Oh, you found it. Wow, okay. Wow, this is, like, this is like instantaneous stuff. It's like I have a producer in the side. So Instaflex is glucosamine, MSM, bark extract, ginger root extract, boswellia serrata extract, turmeric, cayenne, and hyaluronic acid. So that's very interesting, actually. So glucosamine is, um, there was actually a nice study done on glucosamine. Uh, a number of times, people, the makers of glucosamine tablets in Europe have, uh, in fact, it's a, it's a, you have to get a prescription for it in Europe. And um, they showed lots of reduction in joint pain in osteoarthritis with glucosamine. Now the problem is is that if you're selling this stuff and you're doing the research at the same time, it's a little bit dicey, right? You sort of have the, the way that you set up the experiment is often in your favor, that sort of thing. So about probably 15 years ago now, we did a very nice study where we took people who had been taking glucosamine and said, I take glucosamine and it works for me. We said, Great. So we took a couple of hundred of those people and we let them continue their glucosamine or we put them on an identical looking placebo or sugar pill. And we followed them up over six months and we couldn't tell the difference. The, number, the amount of pain people had afterwards, the number of flares of their arthritis that they had were exactly the same. I couldn't draw the lines overlapping any, any better. And then the NIH did a big study on glucosamine, and they couldn't show a difference in hip or knee arthritis as well. So in the, in the controlled studies that have been done with things like glucosamine, it doesn't seem to work very well, or at all. 
On the other hand, it's relatively harmless. It costs a little bit of money. You got to take a whole bunch of pills during the day in order to do it, which is all the downsides. But if it works for you, I usually take credit for it, okay? <laughs> um, so I usually tell people that if they're really, if they can afford it and it doesn't interfere with their other drugs, that to go ahead, try it, and if it works, then that's terrific. You know, um, if, if you feel much better, then you can try withdrawing it and see whether you can get away without it, right? And go from there. So the question is whether the, the low blood counts would affect your iron. So low iron can cause anemia or low red blood cell counts. And these uh, medications in really severe cases can cause low blood, red blood cell counts. They mostly cause low white blood cell counts if they're going to do something. But they can make your red cell counts go down. They're unrelated. So it doesn't make your iron go down. It doesn't affect how much iron you get. But sometimes your doctor is looking at your hemoglobin and it might be a little bit low and they're saying, well, is this your drug or is this because you don't have any iron, enough iron on board? There's some good measures that we can do in the blood to see how your iron stores are. And if they're low, then we can put you on a supplement for a while. Yeah. Yeah, so lots of people ask about massage therapy and whether it's of help. Sometimes what happens is when your joints are really inflamed and irritated, the muscles that are around the joints, they get very tense and they get very, um, and they get very tight and they cause more pain. And so there's really not a lot um, uh, that's a downside, apart from the fact that you often have to pay for it for, for getting massage therapy. It's important if you have uh, spinal arthritis, particularly if you have rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis that affects your spine, that you let your massage therapist know that. They're all aware that sometimes, um, you know, every once in a while somebody's head pops off, but, you know, the, um, so they'll treat it a little bit more carefully. But there's, uh, they can sometimes be very helpful. You can also do some stretching yourself for some of those muscles, and, and they stretch much better if the muscles are nice and warm. So if you're going to try doing your range of motion exercises or your stretching exercises, it's a good idea to either do them right after you've done some form of exercise, like walking around or doing things, or for your neck, you can put a heating pad on it for 10 minutes or so before you try doing the stretching just to warm the muscles up. Yeah, so, so is it best to use heat or ice for inflammation? Basically, if things are hot, it's best to put ice on them. But um, not everybody has read the textbook, and so some people actually find that when they uh, use a little bit of heat on a, on a sore joint that it feels better, and it may be that there's more damage than inflammation. But the I, rule of thumb is that for inflammation, putting some ice on it, uh, for 20 minutes at a time. And you can take like a bag of peas and throw them in the freezer. They'll be all frozen, right? And you can put it on. It molds nicely to the joint. And then you can throw it back in the freezer. You have to put a little X on the bag so you know which one you've been using as the thing. <laughs> Don't cook those peas. But uh, if, if the ice doesn't seem to do very much or it irritates it, then certainly trying some heat is a, is a reasonable option as well. Um, there are some uh, therapies that can sometimes help with mechanical back pain. You know, there's um, those inversion tables where you hang upside down for a little while and, and that stretches things out. And most of what the chiropractor does when he's actually uh, manipulating people's backs is to do the exact same thing. So there's lots of little joints in your spine and what they're doing is they're not putting them into line but they're actually doing very much like when you crack your knuckles, you get that little crack in, your, in, the, in the knuckle and it separates the joints a little bit and it actually relaxes the muscles around that area. So, so something that moves it around in a gentle fashion may be of some benefit from a symptom point of view. So the question is whether arthritis affects hearing. Um, there is an association with hearing loss that goes along with gray hair and glasses. Um, there are some rare forms of arthritis that can affect the bones in the inner ear and the nerves that are there. Those are often things, uh, and they have strange names like relapsing polychondritis and um, 
and uh, uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Um, but the typical forms like osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and the spondyloarthropathies don't usually affect that. Again, it's, um, it's one of those things where as, as you get older and you may accumulate some osteoarthritis, you may also accumulate some other problems like hearing, ooh, hearing deficits. My, this picks up well from here. I'll do some uh, drumming later. Yeah, so uh, medical marijuana is a, is a very uh, hot topic these days. Um, and, um, and we know that um, the, the receptors in the brain that marijuana attach, or some of the components of marijuana that they attach to, uh, can certainly relieve pain. Um, the problem is, is that the science around it isn't as robust, isn't as good as it is with some of the other medications we've used. And what's really lacking is science around what marijuana to use. So if you um, sign up and get a license to have medical marijuana, it's a little bit different. So let's say, for example, that I diagnose you with high blood pressure, and, uh, and I say, okay, I have probably 25 different drugs that I can use to treat your high blood pressure with and multiple doses of those. And so I look at you, look at your medical history, and I say, okay, I want to give you X, Y, Z at so and so many milligrams, and we'll see how this works. And you take it to the pharmacy, and they give you that. In the medical marijuana world, what happens is, is that I say, okay, yeah, you've got bad arthritis. You need some medical marijuana. I'll sign your form. And then you go to the pharmacy, and I'll have the pink ones, please. Okay, so it's you actually talk to the pharmacist, to the marijuana distributor, and they will um, tell you what they think is going to work based on not a lot of science and, and trials that we've sorted out. So our experience has been a little bit mixed. Um, some people find some good relief with it. Most of the people who have tried mar medical marijuana have been using marijuana before they come to see me and ask about it. Um, the, um, and in some cases, it has allowed them to get off of heavy duty narcotics, for example, and to continue working and do very well. So those are the really good cases. In other cases, uh, it has really made no difference. And a lot of people find that they don't like the effect because they get a little bit stoned and they don't feel the, that, it's, that they're as alert as they could be when they're on it. So there's, there's two things. One is, is that you can now get cannabis oil, and it's various. it varies quite a bit. There's really two different ingredients. There's something called cannabidiol, and there's THC. And it's the THC that makes you, you know, feel really stoned, and the cannabidiol that has more of the effect, I think, on the pain side. And you can get anywhere from almost pure cannabidiol to almost pure THC in these uh, products. There's also a synthetic form called nabalone that we can prescribe, and uh, that tends to make people feel quite stoned, actually. So the, the one that's easy to prescribe is a little bit uh, less well tolerated. So it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of an open question, and I think um, it's going to be a, a, a real change in the game come spring when it all becomes legal. Uh, in recreational marijuana usage and how we actually manage that around patients. But it's a very uh, good, good question. Thank you. Yeah, so psoriatic arthritis tends to cause more fusion in the spine um, than it does uh, erosion and damage. So sometimes in the early stages, we can see uh, in the sacroiliac joints, we can see loss of bone and erosions. And then what happens over time is those actually fuse and you end up with more bone formation. So you end up losing range of motion. Um, it's, so it's a little bit tricky, but not particularly like erosions where rheumatoid arthritis, it can actually eat away all the bones in your spine, certainly in your neck as well. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot today. Did you? <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, I love the way Dr. Robinson presents. He makes sure that we understand what he's talking about. I didn't walk away going, wow. 
what was that word? What didn't I, he made sure that we understood everything we needed to understand. I think it's a great gift that he has to be able to share his knowledge in a way that we can all understand. Now we're going to share a little bit more about the Arthritis Society. We are one of the resources that are there for you. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Arthritis Society and um, how people who are living with arthritis can, can live well um, and using the resources that we have to offer. And plus, we also have an event that's going to be coming to Brandon that we're going to be telling you about as well. So again, our sponsors, our, our major sponsor is Celgene, and uh, we have Dr. Tracy Jason and Ellen Chin from Celgene here today uh, to, uh, to view and see what was going on today, but they were the major sponsors and they were one of the main reasons that you were able to attend this free of charge today, so let's please say thank you. And our two secondary sponsors are Rolling Spokes and Safeway Sobies. As you see, they have uh, tables over at the side. Um, Bless, who is one of the co-owners of um, Rolling Spokes, you may have seen him on Westman Communications. He actually taped an interview last week to help to promote this particular event, so maybe you did see him. And uh, so we're very grateful to him for, for doing that for us. And uh, pharmacy at Safeway and Sobeys has been very supportive, not only in Brandon, but in Winnipeg as well, and supporting all of our education, making sure everybody has the opportunity to participate in it. Oh, 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 oh. I don't know if I went the right way. Okay. New toy. I'm not quite sure how it works yet. <laughs> Is that the right one? Okay. Good, good, good. So a little bit about the Arthritis Society. You may not know, but it's been around since 1948. And it has invested in $190 million into research. And that investment has uh, trained rheumatologists. It's helped to develop new drugs, such as the biologics you heard about today, uh, to be able to uh, help with the symptoms. And of course, they're always working towards trying to find a cure. And we raise funds in a variety of different ways in order to be able to fund that research. But the Arthritis Society is the main research uh, funder. Um, our mission is to provide leadership and funding for research, advocacy, and solutions, and to help you live well with arthritis. There we go. A little bit more about what we do. So we, like I said, we talk, I talked about we invested in, in research product, projects. We raise awareness. You might have heard me talking at the beginning about the fact that there have been over 1,500 children in the province that have been diagnosed since the 80s with juvenile arthritis. How many people know that children get arthritis? So that's part of our job is to raise awareness. We raise awareness with the teachers so that they know that this is a possibility and how can they integrate this child's challenges within their classroom. Um, children qu uh, quite often are, they deal with bullying when they have JA because you can't see that they have juvenile arthritis. So they get teased by their classmates, et cetera, when they can't do something. So we try to make sure the teachers understand what's going on. And we also go into the classrooms. We do some uh, childhood reading, and one of, them is the, one of the books we read is called Pain is Like a Grouchy Bear. I bet you some of you actually you know, know what that means. <laughs> I know that I do. We also offer education services, not only for individuals, uh, but for groups as well. We'll go in and talk to staff groups, or uh, sometimes we'll go to medical students or massage therapy students, so they understand what it's like to live with arthritis and a different way they may have to look at or think about when they have a patient who has arthritis. Of course, we have online, so those of you that are tech savvy, we have great resources on our website. But we also do things like this, education in, in person. And we also try to connect people. We want to make sure that there's a lot of resources around you. And we've talked about our Brandon support group, which meets the, is it the first Tuesday of the month? Second, Second Tuesday of the month. Uh, at the, tell me, I'm sorry, I can't remember. No, no. <laughs> Town Center. Next to the food court at, is it 1 o'clock? 1.30, the second Tuesday of every month. And this is a very active group that's always bringing in new education and things to be able to learn about. But they're also there for each other, and that's really important. 
and I am now going to hand it over to Allison. Allison Kirkland is our new Education and Services Coordinator who has joined us at the Arthritis Society uh, just a few months ago, and uh, she's got some great information to share with you, and I'll come back at the end to wrap everything up. Thank you very much for coming out this afternoon. So my name is Alison Kirkland. As she mentioned, I'm Education and Services Coordinator with the Arthritis Society for Manitoba and Nunavut. So um, I, I tell people uh, I'm, I'm the person that gets to spend the money. Um, I'm responsible for the programs we offer, uh, putting together forums like this, the resources that we have available to you, answering questions when you call into the office. I'm, I'm the gal that you get. Um, and we have, in an effort to um, better use the funds that people donate, uh, we've made some changes in how we're structured and whatnot. So a little bit of what I'm going to talk about too is volunteering because my, my position is really an amalgamation of three other positions and a lot of my responsibilities, our hope is to have volunteers um, out, out in the communities delivering our programs, sharing our resources, offering the support. Um, groups like the Brandon Support Group are um, a huge boon for the Arthritis Society and really help us raise awareness and, and for advocacy. So <clears throat> why do we want to do this? Uh, I love this quote, this picture here, um, the person you see speaking, this is from our family day. Uh, a few weeks ago, October 2nd, Sunday, October 2nd, we held an event called Family Day, and it is for the children with arthritis and their families. Um, it's an educational opportunity, it's an opportunity for these families and the kids with arthritis to connect um, and, and do some things in an environment where everybody is like them, instead of being the odd man out. And speaking here is Dr. Kirsten Gerhold, who is the head of pediatric rheumatology at uh, Health Sciences and uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful speaker um, and one of the things she's mentioning here is it's easy to miss what you're not looking for. So something that's been mentioned a few times today is that we have 4.6 million Canadians that are diagnosed with arthritis. We have over 200,000 in Manitoba. Um, currently there's about 600 in the province um, 600 kids in the province that have arthritis and that, that equates to about one child per school in the province. Um, at HSC in their pediatric department, they're, they're treating about 180 alone. So there are a lot of people from infants to older adults that are dealing with arthritis. And unfortunately, a lot of the people that are coping with arthritis um, have waited a long time to get around to dealing with it. Uh, a lot of times we feel aches and pains as we're getting older and we just put it off to aging or something we did during the day and um, we don't go and get things diagnosed maybe as soon as we should. So it's really important to raise awareness for people to be um, conscious of what could be. And so that's a large part of what the Arthritis Society does, is we're really trying to raise awareness and we're trying to uh, increase advocacy. So part of the reason we want to do that is we want you to go to your doctor. Um, we want uh, the people in your life, you know, you're here probably because you've already been to your doctor, you've been diagnosed, um, you, you're doing, you're, you know, you're seeking treatment, you're getting treatment, but there's 60% of uh, the people that have arthritis are under the age of 65. It's the leading cause of disability in Canada. And arthritis is something that if you diagnose it early, it can be treated earlier, which means it can slow or stop the progression. You're still gonna have arthritis, but treatment is going to um, affect how your disease progresses, and the sooner you can do it, the better. So it's really important to get early diagnosis. It's really important to get diagnosis by a physician. In this stage, uh, day and age with the internet, a lot of people are going online and, um, and we do have a symptom checker on our website, but it is fairly specific. But a lot of people are self-diagnosing. Um, but unless you're going to a doctor, you're not getting a definitive diagnosis. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's 119. Presently, we're aware of there being 119 different types of arthritis. So you know about osteo, you know about rheumatoid. We talked about psoriatic arthritis. We've talked about ankylosing spondylitis here today with Dr. Robinson. But there's things like lupus, um, fibromyalgia, things like that. There, there are multiple varieties of uh, arthritis and you need to know what type you have 
to be able to treat it appropriately. And there are a broad variety of treatments. And for that, you need to go talk to your doctor. But your doctor is not the only member of your treatment team. So that's another part of our education, um, our resources, our awareness, and our advocacy is helping you um, and the people in your life. And if you choose to come and volunteer us uh, for us and help us uh, spread our mission, um, you're letting people know that your treatment team is your doctor. It is your pharmacist. Pharmacist is a really crucial part of your treatment team because your rheumatologist, if you're seeing a rheumatologist, knows a lot about rheumatological um, treatments, the drugs being used for that. Um, but, you know, I've had instances where I've had phone calls from people who have said, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what to do because my doctor says I can't take medication for the pain, or my cardiologist says I can't take medication for the pain because it's inter going to interfere with the drugs that I'm taking for my heart problems. And somebody like your pharmacist is going to help you navigate some of those issues. Um, occupational therapists helping you figure out how to be more functional in your day-to-day -day life. Physiotherapists, massage therapists, even psychologists and social workers. Um, if you have arthritis and you've had it for a while, you're aware that fatigue is a huge problem, but you're also aware that depression is a huge part of dealing with a chronic illness and dealing with chronic pain. And it's something that you shouldn't be dealing with on your own. So again, really good to seek the professionals. So the other thing to think about, and we, we brought this up several times, and I, I frankly don't think it can be stated enough, is that arthritis hits people of all ages from infants to older adults. Um, using myself for an example, uh, I started showing signs of arthritis when I was eight years old. Um, part of what the arthritis does, uh, arthritis society does with that money that's looking into research, it took 11 years for me to be diagnosed. Um, okay. And the reason it took 11 years is because research had to catch up with me. They couldn't definitively diagnose it until I had been suffering it from 11 years. Um, but the other things that we, we have and we do, we have Will Wojtowicz, who was our spokesman for uh, Arthritis Awareness Month in September. And Will is, he was um, and is again um, a very active man, uh, very fit, outgoing professional, he's father of two children, and he was hit hard by arthritis coming up on his 40th birthday. He, he's somebody who suddenly um, couldn't get dressed without his wife's help. Um, his young son going to hockey practice, he had to ask other parents to tie his son's skates. Uh, and this is a man who's not even 40 yet. He used to be an athlete, he was a former U of M bison, and he, he was embarrassed. He was depressed, he hid it from everybody, um, but when he found the right doctor and he got the right combination of treatments, it made a world of difference for him. His life has, has turned around and he's expressed that he feels exactly like he did before he had arthritis. He knows that he's gonna have to continue being treated to feel that way, but it's, it's a fabulous thing. We have people, this lovely blonde young woman here um, in the picture, this is Crystal Karakov. Um, she's 31 years of age. She's been on disability since 2009. She first developed arthritis when she was five years old. At 31 years of age, she's had both of her hips replaced. She's had both of her knees replaced. She's waiting to have both of her shoulders replaced. She's in constant pain. Um, but we're at a place where we've been able to help her um, still be at least somewhat functional and give her some hope for the future. And both of these people are really key, um, excellent volunteers for the Arthritis Society. For all her cha challenges, Crystal de Kerkhoff, she, she is on our Divisional Advisory Board. Um, she's been part of our Walk to Fight Arthritis, a part of our steering committee for that. Um, she is the impetus behind our teen support program because she would like to help teens that are, are struggling with the challenges of arthritis. So really crucial part of our team. And that's part of the reason volunteers are so important is to be able to spread their stories, to connect with people, um, to relate with people, as well as to educate. So in terms of finding answers, when you're looking for answers, there's a variety of options that the Arthritis Society can provide. We have forums. 
like you're attending right now. We have education programs. Um, we offer a variety of programs. We have the chronic pain management workshop. We have a workshop on understanding arthritis, on overcoming fatigue. So we have all these options in person, but again, this is where volunteers become really important. We're based in Winnipeg. So it's kind of hard for us to deliver these programs in places like Brandon and the surrounding areas. So if you're thinking that you have something to share and you have some time, I would love to see uh, you come and talk to me about the possibility of volunteering, increasing those programs. But we're also looking for people to represent us at, at health fairs, um, to let people know about the resources we have to share our resources we do. We have stuff that you can get in person, um, you can call us on the phone, but you can also go online and almost all of the resources that the Arthritis Society has, um, if you are tech savvy or you're sharing with somebody who might be and it's not your thing, um, they can go to arthritis.ca and uh, we just, we have a huge amount of stuff on our website. We have everything from uh, downloadable publications um, of all the resources that we have. And if you haven't checked out that back table, please do. It gives you an idea of what you can get in person, but you can also find online. Um, and the website can be a little daunting to navigate if you haven't done it before, but there's lots of great options. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on some of the places you can go on our website. So just learning about arthritis. For people that are fairly newly diagnosed, or maybe you're not that newly diagnosed, but you'd like to learn more, um, you can navigate. This blue bar down the side of the page is going to help you navigate throughout the website. So we have pages where you can come and click on the side about arthritis, and you're going to have um, some generic information on arthritis. But on this slide here at the bottom, we have a list of the more common arthritises. And if you click on them, it'll expand and it'll give you all sorts of information um, on the illness itself or on the type of arthritis itself. It'll give the frequently asked questions. It'll talk about treatments, what you can expect, um, symptoms, things like that. I mentioned earlier the symptom checker. So this is a really, it's, it takes you through. You can go click and answer really easy questions and it takes you through fairly quick, quickly um, to, to help you. Again, we want you to get a definitive diagnosis from your physician, but uh, this might help you know whether it's worth your while to make that appointment and, and get in. So it's really useful. It's also good for helping you prepare for your doctor's appointments to, to come up with your questions. And that's something else that we do have on the site is we have information that, and we also have the hard copies, we have information that will help you um, determine the questions that you need to ask to help you with those doctor's appointments because it, it can be tough. You think about all the stuff that you want to know and then you go into the doctor's office and psh, it's all gone. So we, we have resources that help you with those. Um, some of the other things that we have, so not everybody can make it out to a workshop or we're not maybe able to deliver it everywhere um, that we would like to. So some of our workshops are actually online and one of our best and most popular workshops in person and online is our chronic pain management workshop. So it's an actual program that you can go through online. It's simple, um, it's very much like Dr. Robinson, everything is put out there in easy to understand terms and it's a really excellent it covers um, techniques for managing pain. Um, it talks about the things that are connected to pain, such as stress, anxiety, de depression, how to break that pain cycle, things like that. So we have programs and things like that, online programs that you can do. Um, and day-to-day -day stuff, helping you manage your arthritis in the day-to-day. -day. There's information on that. Um, if you have osteo and um, joint replacement is maybe on your horizon, we have pretty much everything you need to know uh, about joint replacement surgery and um, leading up to it, preparing for it, what questions to ask your doctor about it. So all the stuff that we have, we're always looking for people to find ways to get involved. It's really important to us. And volunteers are a really key part of what we do. We can't do what we do without volunteers. And we have a huge amount of volunteer options. Um, we have people that help us out in the office. We have people that give presentations. We have people that are on our advisory board, um, our walk committee. And uh, Donna's going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, you can just, in talking to people, raise awareness 
uh, tell them if, they're, if they have questions, tell them they can go to our website or call our 1-800 number. And just a quick note, if you call the 1-800 number, I don't know what magic causes it to happen, but you get routed to the office in your province. Yes, so if you call from anywhere in Manitoba, you call that 1-800 number, even though it's a national number, you will get our office in Winnipeg. So good to know, easy to find, um, and you can participate. And again, I'm going to let Donna talk to you a little bit more about participation. However, uh, if I have any way, shape or form or just being here today has inspired you to possibly want to volunteer or at least know more about it, you can certainly come and talk to me afterwards. Thanks. So while Allison does education, I'm the money girl. <laughs> I'm always trying to find ways to uh, find funding, and if it's through corporate sponsors, uh, it's through individual givers, it's through foundations, and it's through events. So we get no funding from the government whatsoever, so we're always looking for ways to raise funds so that we can provide the education, provide the resources, provide funds back to research. That's so very important, as you've heard today, how much research has managed to accomplish in the last 50 years. So there's a variety of ways um, in which people can get involved with all of that. There we go. We are very, very excited that we are bringing the Walk to Fight Arthritis to Brandon. We have just recently booked with the Riverbank Discovery Center, and that's going to be our location, is on June the 4th. The Walk to Fight Arthritis is a national event. It means on that same day, on June 4th, all the way across the country, are thousands of people who are walking to fight arthritis. So it's a huge community, community all across uh, Canada that is all coming together to do this. You, some of you may have been aware of the Jingle Bell Walk Run, which is an event that's been produced here, uh, a run here for the last, I'm actually not sure how many years, but I know it's been around for a while. Uh, and it was decided that we wouldn't be doing that event anymore. And the numbers of people participating were going down, etc. It was time to refresh and do something different. So we're going to be starting with the Walk to Fight Arthritis, which is a very exciting event. When, it's, when you think about how many people all across the country are doing it, all together, all for the same cause. It's very empowering. And so there are a few things that uh, we need to make this happen. One of them ha was uh, finding a location. So we're all good and we're all set with that. I'm going to be looking for people to be on the organizing committee. Uh, it's very important to have people that are local be on the organizing committee who know, you know the businesses and the people and the connections. Uh, so I'm going to be looking for people to do that. If you or somebody you know might be interested in being on the organizing committee, please let me know afterwards. The other thing I'm going to be looking for is I'm going to be hiring on contract a professional event manager. So if anybody knows of a professional event manager you think might be interested in helping to run this event for us, we'll have a contract that starts in the new year and you can send them my way as well and we can, we can talk about it. Again, it would be great to have a local event manager be able to run this event for us. Uh, in Winnipeg, we have about 500 people participate. Uh, there's walks across the country. Sometimes they only have 25 people participate, depending on the size of the, or of the city that it's being held in. Uh, but it's all about coming together for a great cause for people. And 90% of the people that attend either have arthritis or their loved one has arthritis, friends and family. So it's very much a community event that happens. So I'm just going to wrap up and say we are uh, so grateful that you're able to join us today. I'm really hoping that there was something that you got out of it that you're able to take away, just even if it's a one or two nuggets of information, that you're able to walk away with a better understanding or um, uh, even that you can share with somebody else this better understanding. You know, that would be fantastic because you've now become our, our advocates. You'll go out into the community and talk about it. We really are very, very grateful that you're able to join us today and uh, really hoping that in June I will see you at the Walk to Fight Arthritis, although I'm not sure if I'll be here. I might be in Winnipeg, but <laughs> overall, the royal you, that we'll see you there at the Walk to Fight Arthritis. And thank you so much for sharing your time uh, with us and I hope to see you again someday. If there are any questions, please, Allison and I will be around. Please don't hesitate to approach us. 
And uh, again, we still have Sobeys, Sobe Safeway and um, Rolling Spokes over at the side if you didn't get a chance to talk to them. Or we have our information table at the back as well with lots of different information just in case you haven't had a chance to see that yet today. Again, thank you.